Good morning, everyone, and thank you for being here. Before taking questions today, I want to spend a few minutes talking about why raising motor vehicle fees as proposed by the legislature is not only regressive, but it's not needed and makes no sense, at least to me. When I became governor, I told Vermonters that raising taxes and fees would be our last resort. Because across the state, they told me repeatedly they weren't sure they could afford to live here anymore. And it's no secret that Vermont has one of the highest tax burdens in the nation. So we've held the line against raising taxes and fees ever since, without cuts to programs. In fact, quite the opposite. We've actually seen organic revenue growth, which we've used to fund new initiatives, and couple that with a historic amount of funding, Vermont is in better financial shape than I can ever remember. That's why I find it so unfair to ask Vermonters to pay even more, especially when they're faced with so many other fixed cost increases like food, fuel, and rent. But what we're hearing from lawmakers is we need to raise DM fees by 20% because we haven't done it in six years. And that's what inflation has increased since 2016. For awareness, DMV fees include things like driver's licenses and permits, renewals, as well as car, truck, and trailer registrations. And just so everyone understands, the purpose of fees is to fund the operations of a, of a specific program. And in this case, the Department of Motor Vehicles has testified they don't need the money. To justify the increase, House Ways and Means asked the legislature's joint fiscal office to give them the inflation factor since 2016. So our Department of Finance and Management decide to take a look a bit deeper. Here's what they found. First, Vermont's driver's license renewal fees have increased at more than double the rate of inflation since 1996. And that includes the six-year pause of no taxes and fees. That same year, 1996, Vermont had the lowest driver's license renewal fees in our region. Now, even with the six-year pause, they're the highest. They also found we currently have the highest registration fees in our region, and they would get even worse with the fee increase that's been proposed. In fact, if what the House passed becomes law, Registrations would be twice the average of our six neighboring states. Now, there are more examples we can provide, but I want to at least give you some context. The other argument I've heard is that they need the money for the federal match I keep talking about. Two things about that. Number one, we have the cash without raising fees because we can use the historic surpluses. And number two, if they're successful in raising the fee, it will never be reduced after raising all the one-time match money we need. It doesn't sunset. That's why the fiscally responsible thing to do is use the cash we have, which will pay dividends for years to come without burdening the very people we're trying to help. So with that, I'll turn it over to Secretary Flynn. Thank you very much, Governor, and, and good morning, everybody. <clears throat> I think you'll hear that I think a lot like the Governor. Fees raised by DMV provide Vermont's monetary share needed to fund highway construction and maintenance projects. The remainder of dollars needed for construction come from the Federal Highway Administration, as you've heard, at a ratio of at least four to one. The Agency of Transportation under the Scott administration, has now delivered seven consecutive transportation budgets without once increasing DMV fees. Two of those budgets, including this year's as recommended, are of record size. 
Also included in this year's budget, as you heard, is a request to the legislature to set aside $80 million from the general fund tax surplus to secure Vermont's monetary share for construction projects and maintenance across fiscal years 24, 25, and 26. The House budget, though, is suggesting to increase DMV fees, resulting in Vermonters paying 20% more and collecting another $20 million across the board. Everything from driver's licenses to vehicle registrations, trailer registrations, tra uh, vehicle transfers, transit buses, delivery trucks, commercial vehicles, and the list goes on. Over 200 fee categories are proposed to be increased. As you also heard, the last fee increase was in 2016 in a previous administration. Some are saying we should have raised fees sooner, and if we only had, they would not need to raise them so much now. If the legislature had felt strongly about that in previous years, it could have imposed a fee increase on its own, like it is this year. Instead, it passed our previous six budgets without doing so, agreeing with what we had recommended. It was also said that Vermont has long left federal dollars on the table for a lack of enough money in the state's transportation fund. Let me be clear. The Agency of Transportation does not ever leave federal formula dollars on the table. If we are given an apportionment, we use it. There is no lack of enough money in the state's transportation fund. However, not all of the money Vermonters pay into the transportation fund is kept in the transportation fund. Every year, year after year, $20 million is transferred out of the transportation fund that Vermonters pay their DMV fees into. This money goes to bolster other parts of state government. The governor's transportation budget ensures our share will be secure, construction and maintenance projects will go forward without delays, delays that would have been caused by our share not being available or predictable and it ensures that the Vermont economy will continue to churn with hundreds of projects and thousands of jobs that are necessary to deliver them. It is not necessary now to increase DMV fees on Vermonters. Doing so would be regressive, striking a blow to those who can least afford it. Fees can remain as they are, and the transportation fund should be kept intact, left alone, and used for transportation purposes. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary Flynn. Uh, now I'll open it up to questions. Governor, as you know, some of those surpluses that you're talking about that lawmakers uh, aren't using for the federal match, those are going to other initiatives like paid leave, child care, et cetera. What do you make of the argument that having robust pro social support programs like those actually save Vermonters money and that these fee increases at the DMV, um, you know, those pale in comparison to what a parent might be paying for child care or uh, others. Well, again, we agree with the goal. We want paid family leave. We want more child care. In fact, this administration, under my watch, has done more for child care than any other administration of previous record. So we have a common interest here. It's just about how we get there and how fast. They'd like to do it all in one year, um, which is uh, admirable, but it's not practical. Uh, we, this is something I believe that we need to build over a period of time so that we have the organic growth to be able to have it uh, be self-sufficient. So. Again, we have the same, same goals. We have uh, paid family leave in our bill, a voluntary plan. Uh, we have child care, increasing uh, child care uh, provisions as well in our bill. Um, but it isn't the same as theirs. Theirs is much more generous, but we contend 
uh, that we'll get to the same place probably quicker than they will if they follow our lead and then be able to use the surpluses for one-time expenses as we've said. This one-time expense is this federal money that's coming our way. This federal money's not going to be recurring. It's a one-time shot. We're going to get at this. So we better make sure we have the match money to take advantage of every single federal dollar that comes our way. And this is the most secure way to do that. I have an off-topic question if we're good, if everyone's good on topic was. I was just wondering if you had any thoughts or comment kind of, of uh, what's, going down, what's going on down in Tennessee with the legislature and two out of the three being um, expelled and just if you had any thoughts or comment on what's going on down there. You know, I haven't, uh, I haven't followed it um, consistently, uh, but I've seen broadly what's been happening over the last 24 hours in particular. First, I want to make sure that everyone in Vermont understands this wouldn't happen in Vermont. Um, it's unfortunate that it's happening there. Uh, as many of you know as well, uh, I believe in respect and civility. I think that's number one. I believe in the process. I believe in decorum. I, uh, I was president of the Senate at one time. I presided over the Senate. Uh, and we adhered to that. There are rules and regulations for that. But they're rules and regulations, right? They're policies. They're not criminal acts. To expel someone from a legislative office who has been elected by their constituents to represent them over a rule violation, I think is way over the top. And again, I don't believe that there's any place for that. Uh, it seems to me, and again, uh, I'm not trying to give advice to them. Uh, we have our own issues here in Vermont, but this isn't one of them. And I think it could be dealt with in a much, much more even-handed way uh, with, with different, different provisions, different uh, penalties of sort uh, for uh, violating the rules of their chamber. I have another off-topic one. Um, a handful of Republican representatives introduced a bill this morning that would prevent those that were <coughs> assigned a male uh, at birth and are transitioning to become a female and would prevent them from playing sports as a female um, in Vermont. I don't know if you had any initial thoughts on that. Well, again, I, uh, I go back uh, to when I played sports when I was a kid. Uh, I can't tell you uh, how many games we won, how many games we lost, what the scores were. Uh, we just played baseball and basketball and hockey. Uh, and I would ask, that we take that segment of the population and just let them play. Let them be who they are and let them play. Now, on a higher level, professional, collegiate, and so forth, then there probably should be some parameters. But let's let the kids be kids. Yesterday, Governor, um, you know, it, it appears that Vermont is on track to set another record year for fatal opioid overdoses. Yesterday, as you might have seen, a group of advocates and some lawmakers are calling on lawmakers to restart the conversation on safe injection sites and decriminalization of some drugs. Has, has your thought process changed uh, on, on that since last well, year? Well, obviously, uh, fentanyl has changed the game across the country. It's not just here in Vermont. Uh, I think we've seen increases in almost every other state. Um, and uh, it is something we need to pay attention to, and we are. I think prevention and treatment, uh, recovery, uh, are, are three areas that we need to, to, to make sure that we're, we're focusing on, which we are. Uh, I also think uh, enforcement uh, is another area, taking uh, the fentanyl out of the, out of the stream, so to speak, I think would be, would be helpful. There's also xylazine uh, that uh, that is becoming more prevalent, uh, that is, when mixed with fentanyl, um, is uh, concerning um, because naloxone doesn't have any effect on xylazine. So we have many areas that we're uh, you know, trying to, to make sure that we're, we're paying attention to, uh, but um, the so-called safe injection sites isn't one, and I don't believe that's the answer.
You mentioned the, the treatment and uh, recovery. The hub and spoke model, um, you know, Vermont has certainly been a, a leader in that nationally. How do you think that's, that's holding up? I mean, do you think any changes need to be made to our Expanding, uh, obviously. I mean, I think there's more, uh, there's more fentanyl, there's more drug use. Um, we need more prevention, and we need, uh, we need more of the uh, hub and spoke uh, throughout Vermont. Uh, so we need more treatment facilities. When, when somebody's ready for recovery, we better make sure that we're ready to take care of them and you know, lead them on that path. And lastly, H222, I think it is. Uh, it's kind of a grab bag, if you will, of initiatives. It's got you know expansion of syringe um, collections, zoning for recovery group home houses, expansion of Narcan. I, any thoughts on 222? I, I haven't looked at 222, to be honest with you. But uh, um, we have always advocated uh, for uh, the syringe exchange, uh, as well as disposal sites, uh, more prevention, uh, anything like that that we're already doing, uh, we want to do more of. But um, so, but I haven't looked at that bill in particular. And Governor, you mentioned that the safe injection sites and overdose prevention centers aren't the answer. Um, when you, you vetoed the bill last year, you said you didn't want to take away from the resources that have already been proven to, to work, whether it's the Narcan or distribution of Narcan or the fentanyl test strips. But you mentioned xylazine there um, and how it's not being able to be detected. So I don't know kind of what you think needs to be done to, to help with that. Yeah, I'm not sure that xylazine can't be detected. It just can't be treated with naloxone uh, to prevent an overdose, a death. And that's the concerning factor there. Um, so that's where, uh, again, more enforcement in terms of taking it out of the, the, uh, the drug uh, stream, so to speak, uh, is going to be critical. We'll go to the phones now and we can come back to folks in the room. Um, start with Tim McQuiston, Vermont Business Magazine. Tom Davis, Compass Vermont. Thanks, Jason. Governor, back on uh, motor vehicle fees. Uh, how is the progress going on the proposal to have uh, an electric vehicle fee and replace the gas tax for the number of electric vehicles? I don't know where we are today. Um, again, we put forth a proposal uh, that would be a more of a mileage uh, reimbursement. Uh, fee uh, and my preferred uh, method, and I think the Senate has talked about this some, um, uh, would be to to utilize the uh, the charging itself. Uh, to but but I don't know as we're there yet. I don't know if the uh, the power companies can actually do this or not effectively. So it's still in conversation. Hopefully we'll get to a point where because we're at, I think we have about six percent of the vehicles sold of, of late of being electric vehicles. So they're, being, they're in demand, um, and we need to make sure that they're paying their fair share. I mean, it's a user fee, as I, as I see it. So uh, we're, still, we're still working on it. I don't know where it's at in uh, the Senate uh, at this point in time. Do you know if uh, the strongest voice is for the legislature to increase the overall motor vehicle uh, fees of our in alignment with the trans and the attempt to also get the electric vehicle fees put in place once you figure out the can. Um, I, I don't know if I'm understanding the question. Is are they in favor of uh, DMV fees along with the other motor Raising the DMV fees? No, they are they in favor of the electrical vehicle user fees? As much as they are for raising the fees of all the other things in the motor vehicle department. I don't think it's either or uh, for the legislature, and I don't want to speak for them, um, but I think that they see the merit in trying to come up with some way uh, to impose a fee uh, on on electric vehicles. Um, but uh, but they also feel, at least in the House, uh, have felt pretty strongly. Obviously, they voted it out to raise um, raise the MV fees by twenty percent. Across the board. Okay. Uh, no other questions. Thank you. 
Chris Roy, Newport Daily Express. Yes, good morning. I have no questions. Thank you. And Pete, I couldn't remember if you said you had a question or if you were just listening, so if you have one. If not, we'll go back to the room if anyone has others. The Senate Appropriations Committee, um, they're set to pass out a committee today of Bill that would raise legislator pay and open legislators up for health care benefits as well. What's your take on that? I've, uh, I've responded in the past. I, my feelings haven't changed. Uh, I would be in favor of raising the pay of legislators and, and benefits if we could restrict the length of the session. I, I view this as a contract over a, maybe a 90-day period. Uh, get them in, get them out. If, if some of the, the, the thought is that this will attract more people to run for the legislature, um, I'm in favor of that. I think that we need to, to do more. Uh, but I think what, what, what you'd find uh, when I'm speaking to people about running for the legislature, it's the time commitment. It's like you don't know how long the session's going to last. It can be anywhere from four to six months. And, uh, and for them to leave their, their, their careers to do this on a part-time basis just doesn't work for them. So if we could restrict and, and shorten the session, I think that would attract in, in of itself without raising pay, that would attract more people. Uh, but having said that, if, if they wanted to raise pay, um, then I would be in favor of that if we could couple it with reducing the length of the session. Do you think it's a top salad for monitors right now, politically, for legislators to be potentially increasing their own pay with yes. that 8%? Yeah. Yeah, I, th I don't think the everyday Vermonter would understand that. 90 days, that's really short. Not according to other states. Bigger states have 90-day provisions. There are states who, uh, who meet every other year. Um, so we're a very small state. We can get the work done. Um, we have to prioritize in order to do so. But I think that that would make the process better. Governor, I, I have one more. I don't know if Secretary French or Deputy Secretary Boucher is on, but... They aren't on today. They're at a conference. Maybe you can weigh in. There's a couple of bills that have been floated this session that have been taken up basically mandating certain curriculums, whether that be Holocaust education or financial literacy is one from the Treasurer's office. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on, on lawmakers setting or, or mandating curriculum, which as you may know is, is created on the, the local level, standards are made on the statewide level through um, the Board of Education. I was wondering if you had any thoughts on, yeah. on what this shift could be. Well, again, these are important issues. Um, I've, I've always thought that we should have, um, have more of an awareness about the Holocaust in particular, um, because history has a way of repeating itself. and. And we can't forget uh, history and, and sweep it under the carpet um, because that's, it was real. And I'm not sure that everyone understands that. So I, I you know, for that one situation in itself, I think uh, there needs to be more. I think financial literacy, uh, again, is something that should be taught uh, because I, I'm not sure that everyone has an awareness as to how to balance uh, their own lives uh, and and how to, uh, to, to make sure that they have the resources for the future. Uh, I will say one thing. I, I think even the legislature uh, might consider um, a financial literacy type of program uh, for the first couple of days of the session. And, and I'm just saying to understand the finances and how they work in the state, I think would be, um, would be well suited for the legislature because typically the appropriations committees, uh, ways and means, and finance, they understand how it all works. But not every legislator understands that uh, and how the, the inner workings of a state government and, and fees and fee structures and so forth. So I think it would be beneficial for all of us uh, to get a refresher course on financial literacy. Just as a follow up, the, the, the concept, though, of, of the legislature setting curriculum, yeah. whether it be 
financial right. literacy. Yeah, I know. Whatever it's, it may it's, be. What, what do you make of, of that? It's, it's like micromanaging a bit in, in a system that um, is supposed to be locally controlled. Uh, we have a state board of education as well. I, I think there is a way uh, to connect all of that. Uh, but uh, but you can't pick and choose, right? So there are some other areas um, where I think local communities, local school boards, and local supervisor unions want to focus on uh, as well. So finding that balance uh, is uh, is always difficult. Um, but um, but again, some of these issues should we should make sure that the the students are aware, our youth are aware of uh, of both history and everyday reality. Okay. Have a have a great Easter for those who are celebrating. Thank you. Thank you.